but I'm grateful that several of our students are here. Uh, listening to Sue talk, I had two reactions. One was I wanted to completely rewrite my own talk. <laughs> and the second was a phenomenal parallel process of reliving my mom's 10 years of Alzheimer's disease and reliving the things we did well, the things we completely screwed up, <laughs> and, um, and yet how we got through it. Um, there's a wonderful video that many of you may have seen called uh, Confessions of a Dutiful Daughter, I borrow it from Margaret Neal often, uh, in which it's, it really chronicles the daughter's experience with her mom's progressive dementia. And, and I really identify with so much in that film as you start to identify early on that your loved one is changing and you don't know why. Um, and I, I promise not to hijack this whole talk uh, to tell you stories about my mom, but I hope you'll indulge me if I throw in a couple <laughs> as examples. One of the things I am most passionate about in my work life um, is really providing solid care for people as they approach the end of life. Um, 30 years ago, when hospice was first coming to the United States, almost all of our patients were cancer patients. 30 years ago was a very different time in medicine. Uh, that's not true any longer. In fact, what's much more prevalent is that our patients in hospice programs are more often patients with multiple uh, comorbidities, uh, including many of the people that all of you take care of and the frail elderly. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what, why that makes it difficult uh, to get our patients um, onto hospice, even though they may well need it. We all know, and, and Sue has already covered, that dementia is described as a syndrome of progressive decline in cognitive and intellectual functioning, um, and the personality and behavior changes that can last from two to 10 years. I remember when my mom was first diagnosed that uh, my sister said, how long can this last? And I said, a long time. And as a social worker, many of the things that came into my mind were things like, will their money last? Hi. <laughs> Do you want me to start over? <laughs> Sorry. I'm half deaf. How's that? Is that better? OK, good, good. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> um, you know, and again, I think it's, it's no surprise to all of you in the room that in addition to um, how we care for a person with dementia, we're also challenged by looking at different settings of care for a person with dementia. In my parents' situation, we moved them four different times depending on what was happening for each of them. We were very fortunate that my dad took care of my mom at home until he was 88 years old. Um, but at that time, he had hearing loss, macular degenerative disease, and it had just really gotten to the point where it was no longer possible. And probably the, the most striking experience for us was when my mom came home in the police car. <laughs> and you have to understand, my mom was this very uh, well-mannered, well-dressed, very sweet Swedish immigrant. Um, and earlier in her life, to come home in a police car would have been horrible horrifying to her. Uh, they'd come home from church as they went to every Sunday. They, they went to sleep in their matching recliners in the living room and my mom woke up, took one look at my dad and hiked back to the church, <laughs> which was about f four miles away. And there she was sitting on a bench by the church and, and this nice young policeman brought her home as he, she said. <laughs> And it was th at that point that we were starting to realize that it was no longer working. Well, that brings up a whole other issue about where do you provide care for people, how do you afford care, um, and what are our options. And obviously, m most of us are not blessed with the kinds of resources that would allow us to pay independently for care long term. Um, so again, forgive my self-indulgence by telling you some of the stories. I hope I'm making it, it relevant. But we also know that the most common cause of dementia and other disease-related dementias affects, as Sue said, many, many people. 10% um, of people 65 or, or older and 25% aged 85 or older. Um, and by mid-century, the number is expected to grow to 14 million elders living with um, advanced uh, Alzheimer's disease alone. And uh, obviously, as you all know, and I feel like I'm singing to the choir also, um, that, that the elderly are, with dementia are particularly vulnerable to depression, anxiety, confusion, geriatric symptoms such as urinary incontinence, eating problems, and, and risks of falls. 
We also know that there are a lot of progressive neurological disorders that may be accompanied uh, by dementias, and I think it's really important to be on the lookout for that. Uh, my dad had undiagnosed Parkinson's and was becoming quite disoriented, but we didn't know why. Um, and so I think that as caregivers, it's so important to be alert to the, all the things that may be going on in addition to dementia or in addition to a chronic illness uh, on the part of, of, of an elderly person. We also know that uh, we, we may see uh, older adults with a dementia experience periods of confusion, delirium, hallucinations, and agitation. Um, one of the things I learned from working at hospice and palliative care was how complicated it could be in working with someone with dementia and trying to treat the symptoms that could be stimulated either by a urinary tract uh, infection or a history of trauma, as, as Sue mentioned. Um, I, and I want to give a shout out to my colleagues colleagues from Partners in Care, formerly Hospice of Washington County, because after we moved my parents to Oregon, they took superb care of them, and I, to that I'm forever grateful. Um, what we know is that, for example, I, I think about a veteran that we had on our hospice and palliative care program who had been a gunner in, in three wars. His trauma history was phenomenal. And he started to hallucinate, he had advanced dementia, and there was nothing that we could do to relieve his agitation. And it was like during, during his waking hours and during his sleeping hours, he was reliving all of his trauma from the wars. And the usual things that we used to, to try to calm down agitation in hospice weren't working. And it was because of a, a very astute uh, geriatric psychiatric nurse pr practitioner that we found the right balance of antipsychotic medications to try to help with that. But that may not be the first place we start when a person is at the end of their life. And so I think that we really need to understand, as many of you have, have discussed, what is their history? You know, what has been their experience before? What is calming, as Sue said? Uh, what is disturbing? Um, because that will often be the source of some of the behaviors. I supervise two uh, recent social work graduates who both work at Elder Place, and they're educating me on the language of behaviors. And one of the reasons that that's I interesting to me is that my mom, while she had Alzheimer's, all six of her sisters died of dementia-related disorders. Now, you might imagine that strikes fear in the heart of my sister and myself. So if I can't remember where I parked my car, it's not very long for me to go to freak out mode. <laughs> you know? And I said to my husband recently, I said, you know, our, my, people in my family live forever, but the women lose their minds, and I think we should plan for that. And without even looking up, he said, I don't like where this is going. <laughs> so I think what's, what's important to remember is that, we, that again, there are so many variables that go into really adequately assessing uh, the symptoms of someone with dementia, particularly as end of life might be approaching. One of the things that you all know is that although invariably fatal, dementia disorders are varied and they're unpredictable in their course and their progression. And unfortunately, that makes it very hard to plan for things like hospice care. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. But it also complicates prognostication. It prevents anticipatory planning. Uh, it creates what, what many authors call ambiguous loss, where families are unable to experience closure or really begin to grieve the loss of a previously present and functioning parent, partner, or other relative because they're still here. So what do you do with that? What do you do with that? It's complicated. Um, and I think what we want to do in palliative care is always to provide comfort. I'd like to talk just for a minute about the differences between what palliative care is and what hospice care is. Hospice care, most of you are probably familiar with, and in order to be eligible for hospice care, two physicians have to determine that a person is within the last six months of life or less. Now, some diseases, that's pretty easy to predict. Many cancers, for example, are very easy to predict in terms of when are we looking at perhaps the last six months of life. But other diseases, chronic illnesses, congestive heart failure, COPD, um, many, many, many of the chronic illnesses that our older adults are, are dealing with are very hard to prognosticate, and certainly dementia falls into that category. And so in order to be eligible for hospice, you have to have that six-month or less prognosis. You also have to give up any 
type of curative treatment uh, to be able to be cared for under the hospice program. Hospice became a Medicare benefit about 30 years ago, um, and one of the things that has happened is that there's much more regulatory scrutiny on who is receiving hospice care. Um, it, about you know 10 years ago, we had a lot of patients in hospice care that had dementias and other chronic illnesses, and we could admit people under a, a term in hospice called debility unspecified. That's kind of the, the, the black box now. We don't want to admit anybody with that because that's a red flag for Medicare to really scrutinize what we're doing. My mom was one of those outliers who was on the hospice for three years. Um, not ours in Oregon. I'm, I, can, I can reassure you, Kate, it wasn't ours. <laughs> she was only on ours for about a year. But nowadays, me Medicare would take a look at that and say, mm -mm, this is not appropriate because it doesn't fit the parameters of a six month or less prognosis. So many of us got interested in moving the concept of hospice upstream, meaning why do we have to wait until they're in the last six months of life to provide people the kind of support that could really change and enhance their quality of life? Um, I certainly saw that in the cancer field as people started living for a very long time, even with advanced cancers. And many of my patients did not want to give up active treatment in order to receive a hospice benefit. So a number of us for a long time have been saying, we've got to change the model. We have to change the model. The hospice regs were written 30 years ago for a very different patient population than the ones that we save or that we serve in hospice. So fortunately, there's been a groundswell of movement uh, called palliative care, which has really taken hold nationwide. And what palliative care really is, is it's, it's actually a concept, it's a philosophy of care, and I would suggest, suggest probably every one of you in the room is practicing palliative care in some way. If you look at the formalized palliative care teams, most of them are hospital-based, uh, so it requires an inpatient stay, and generally they're just like hospice interdisciplinary interdisciplinary teams of physicians, nurses, social workers, and chaplains and volunteers to really aggressively uh, provide symptom management uh, and also to extend the unit of care from just the patient to include the family. Um, unfortunately, there is very little reimbursement at this point for palliative care. Uh, and therefore, uh, the hospitals and also home health agencies have been a little bit reluctant to implement um, fully staffed palliative care programs because of the lack of reimbursement. I was really fortunate when I worked at Hospice of Washington County that we had a very well staffed and supported palliative care program in which patients such as the kind of patients you care for each day were referred to us and we could go to see them wherever they were, at home, in a nursing home, in assisted living, adult foster care homes, to really take a look at their plans of care and see was there something we could do differently? Could we add a different medication? Could we add some distraction? Could we uh, do some of the kinds of things that Sue is, is talking about in terms of really enhancing quality of life? Uh, what's happening right now is that many home health agencies um, are adding palliative care programs, but they're somewhat limited in that they may involve only a nurse visit periodically to just try to help you establish your goals of care. I think that we'll see huge changes in this in the next number of years. Um, I'm part of a grant up at OHSU right now in which we are doing a, a hospice, I mean, excuse me, a palliative care demonstration program on the outpatient ambulatory oncology program, and part of the grant is contingent upon us creating a payment structure for insurance so that they know what to pay us. You know, many insur you know, progressive insurers will say, we know it's less expensive if we can avoid a hospital stay or an emergency visit or room visit or that type of thing, but we don't know how to pay for the services yet. Nor did we for hospice 30 years ago. And so I think if you stay tuned, we'll have an opportunity to really extend the reach of palliative care. And my bias, uh, to quote a colleague, Dr. Cameron Muir, who's a palliative care doctor on the East Coast, he says we ought to bring, bring, bring in palliative of care at the day of diagnosis, no matter what the prognosis is. Um, so what is palliative care? The idea is to provide quality of life, to really help maintain the dignity uh, of both the patient and the families, and to really aggressively go after pain and symptom management. I think ideally we should all be doing that all the time. You know, we shouldn't have to wait until things are getting really, really dicey to do that. But I think um, speaking to the geriatric population, while there's a lot in, uh, 
in common with good palliative care in general, the areas that I think really need to be emphasized if you're going to provide good palliative care to an elderly person is obviously knowledge of aging, health, palliative care. Uh, I can't say enough about comprehensive geriatric assessments, uh, all of my my esteemed colleague, Dr. Ekstrom, how important that is. I, it's really helpful to have clinical case management, and there's some progressive programs that have that, and particularly at care transitions. As I mentioned, we moved my parents four times to four entirely different kinds of settings as their, their needs progressed. And certainly a family-centered practice and an interdisciplinary practice. One family may need aggressive uh, medical symptom management. Another may need the psychiatric nurse practitioner or geriatric psychologist, another family may need a really good chaplain or a social worker who can help broker many of this, the services that are out there. So supportive and palliative care suggests a broader framework that views dementia from, again, the time of diagnosis through the time of death and bereavement. Um, and during the early stages, palliative care's goals, not unlike the goals most of you have, uh, are to keep patients and caregivers educated and supported. And then during advanced stages, recognizing and treating the needs of both. Some of the areas of concern that you'll hear all palliative care teams talk about is the value of advanced care planning. With people with dementia, I can't stress enough how crucial it is to do this early early, early, early. While uh, the person may be at the beginning stages of dementia, but they still may have the capacity to tell us how much care do they want. When my mom was actually finally diagnosed after you know a, a number of months of not knowing what was going on, the social worker at the University of California Center for Aging in San Diego, uh, after we had this team conference and they showed us all the results of the tests that she had done, the social worker said, now I'm going to meet with you and talk about about advanced care planning. Now, I've, I've worked in end-of-life care my whole career, and I, I thought, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> and, and I will say that even though we, my parents, bless them, were really skilled at telling us what they needed, documenting it, making the decision, making easy, as a daughter, when it came down to it, still wasn't easy. Okay? I'll never forget, as my dad was dying, one of our most seasoned uh, uh, nurses in hospice pulling her chair up to me, knee to knee, and saying, Susan, it's time to embrace the hospice concept. <laughs> Bless her. Um, and while we were think all we were talking about was antibiotics. It wasn't like discontinuing event, which I've helped families do for years. And I thought how cavalier that I thought that was an easy decision. Um, so, you know, bless, bless them for doing that. I can't stress strongly enough how crucial it is to do advanced care planning as early as you possibly can. Um, also, certainly, we want to provide psychological support, spiritual support, management of acute events, and terminal care. I think one of the, the things that I think about a lot in dealing with, with d dementia is grief. Grief for the person who has dementia and grief for the family members as well. The other things that I'll briefly acknowledge are depression, anxiety, and certainly delirium that can also be a part of the experience. But we know that, as, as Sue alluded to, that there are higher levels of depression uh, for people who are caring for individuals with dementia. Um, I think that Ken Doka said it really well when he said, grief is the constant yet hidden companion of Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. Why might that be? Okay, just off the top of your heads. You're losing things over and over again. Yeah, yeah. Other thoughts? Yeah. What else is lost during dementia? Dignity. Dignity. Self, yes. Yes. I'm sorry? Independence. Independence. Yeah. Safety. Your routine. Ru routine. And somebody said relationship. In fact, that's a wonderful segue to something I want to read to you from uh, an article in, from the New York Times in this, this year, January, called When They Don't Know They Are Ill. And this is a quote from Mr. Floyd, who's, whose wife uh, had dementia. And he said, for 42 years, we discussed everything sorrows, joys, concerns. In all those things, Connie was my partner and I hers. Suddenly, here we were facing the biggest challenge of our marriage. Connie was the one person with whom I couldn't discuss it. One of the saddest and most frustrating parts of the journey was that we could never become a team. 
She seemed to feel that if she could hide the symptoms, the disease wouldn't be there. He told me, adding that she didn't want anyone to know about her illness. I kept telling her this journey would be so much easier with other people at our side, but she just didn't see it that way. Which really came home for me because that was very much my mom. And the number of times we tried to send in care at home and the number of times in her beautiful cashmere sweater and her perfectly coiffed hair that she sent them away, I could count on many hands. <laughs> So grief is also not only experienced by family members, but certainly experienced by the individual in the early stages of the disease as they experience and anticipate symptoms. They know it. They know it. When my mom could still talk about it, she would talk about how scared she was. And we found lots of evidence in cleaning out her bureau of all the little articles she'd clipped out of the newspaper about some wonderful cure for memory problems. And we had a stash of ginkgo tea that would, you know, float a boat, you know. And, and the kinds of things that, you know, she knew how scary it was. She knew. Um, and for family members, it, grief increases as they witness the deterioration of memory and the slow decline in their loved ones. So I, I think it... it to me, what makes sense is it's, it's a whole cascade of losses. The loss of the past as memory deteriorates, the loss of memory that affects current relationships, the loss of roles, the loss of independence, and then additional losses such as if a loved one dies but the person with dementia doesn't remember it. And then you have to, they have to relive it again as they ask the question again, uh, which is so painful. Same, same picture as Judy. I think we were talking about the same thing, weren't we? <laughs> I think for families, they experience a continuous and profound sense of loss, and the grief may become more intense uh, as the patient's symptoms increase. And families experience the death of the person who once was. Um, I got married uh, relatively late for the first time in my 40s, and by that time, my mom was well into her dementia. And um, I, I I took my then fiance down to visit her in a memory care unit, and it was Christmas time, and my husband's a, a musician, and he just sat down, and my mom had not been very verbal at that point, and he sat down and just randomly started playing uh, Oh Holy Night. Now, my mom had been the, the soloist at Christmas Eve in this little Lutheran church forever, and of course, every Christmas Eve, that's what she sang, and she started to sing. She remembered every note, she remembered every word, and my sister and brother-in-law and my dad and I were just dumbfounded. And my husband, now my, now my husband, he turned around and we're all just <laughs> you know, sobbing. And, and he's like, what? You know? And later my dad called him and just said, thank you for giving Margaret back to me for a few minutes, which was so lovely. But then when I actually told her that I was getting married, and she had gotten sort of frozen in time around the time when she was sure that my life was going to be over if I didn't get married, um, she <laughs> I said to her, I said, Mom, we're getting married. And she said, what? You? She said, that's a lucky break. <laughs> Which, which my husband and I use all the time now. And I used it at her eulogy to say she was right, you know. <laughs> but you know, I think that's the other part of a family's dilemma between the sorrow of under recognizing all the losses as they occur. You have to find those moments to laugh at. And I could, I could lock you in this room and tell you hours worth of stories, but I won't. <laughs> um, but, but I think that, that that's part of what, what you struggle with as a family member is, is how do you continue to, um, to have a relationship with this person who's no longer the person that they were? And, and in my family, I think my family is typical of a lot of families, we all dealt with it differently. And, and that you know, was, was challenging in its own way. When you have confusion, sundowning, one of you mentioned sundowning, agitation, belligerence, you know, that I think is also incredibly painful for family, family members, certainly painful for us as professionals, but I think for family members it's more evidence of how, how difficult things are, and particularly if the person becomes very paranoid and starts to blame their loved ones for things that have happened or are sure that you've betrayed and abandoned them, when you see these families that have done anything but that. Um, it's, it's painful. And I think that's where caregiver support is so crucial. And I see our colleague who facilitates uh, powerful tools for caregivers, which is a wonderful model. Um, I think that, as, as Sue said, 
the sooner we can get caregivers to support, the better. Um, because I think you have to help people tease out that it's not personal. It's the disease. It's not personal. But boy, does it feel personal sometimes. When we moved my mom to the memory care unit the first time, she looked at me and said, she said, I am going to go and find a different family that isn't abandoning me. At which point I looked at my brother-in-law and said, uh, could you take over here for a minute? And I went into the bathroom and just cried my eyes out. You know, I mean, just, it's painful. It's so painful. And you know it's the dementia speaking, but, but you don't know it, too. You know, and so, again, I can't say strongly enough how important it is to get people support early. Um, and I think it, successful management of those difficulties can make an invaluable contribution to people, particularly at the end of life. One of the things that's really hard, as I mentioned earlier, is when is a patient eligible for hospice with these comorbid conditions that are difficult to, to forecast? Well, the, how many of you are uh, familiar with the functional assessment staging tool? A few of you? That's a tool that uh, is used for most hospice programs to assess a level of dementia with a score of seven being the criteria for admission to many hospice programs. Um, and so if, if you don't aren't familiar with it, hopefully the hospice program that you're referring to will be so that they can help tease out, is this person ready? or not, you know, and so to be admitted, as I mentioned, with, with a diagnosis of dementia, the patient must have symptoms including incontinence of bowel and bladder, inability to dress without assistance, inability to speak more than six intelligible words in the average day, a progressive weight loss of 10% body weight over the preceding six six months. Uh, so those are some of the things hospices are going to be looking for. And if they come to, to do, you can always ask for an educational visit or uh, an assessment, an intake assessment. They'll tell you whether or not they think your, your client is yet eligible. If they're not, ask the question, do you have a palliative care team? Because that may be the next step if they're not quite ready for hospice, but they could sure benefit from some additional supports and services. Obviously, the experience of caregiving can really complicate grief. Not only are the issues of, um, you know, the person's still here, so you can't really finish your goodbyes, but also, as has been mentioned, caregivers are exhausted. You know, they're spending all their energy trying to take the best care possible of their loved one, particularly if they're still in the home setting. But even if they're not in the home setting, they may be coming to visit every single day. They may be putting, be putting everything else in, in their life on hold. Um, and again, caregivers can experience many secondary losses, such as loss of social and recreational roles, work roles and relationships with others. When a person with dementia is ca cared for at home for a long period of time, it's not uncommon for family members to become exceedingly isolated. Um, and that can just add to the complications of grief and the experience of depression. And it may result in what we call chronic sorrow and reactive depression. I find that when, by the time caregivers get to our services, uh, whether that's in a cancer clinic or in a dementia a geriatric clinic or in a hospice, that, that often they've been providing care for a really long time and they, they really minimize the impact that it's taken on them, both physically, socially, psychologically. Um, and often I've heard caregivers say, if I let out any of this grief, it'll be like Humpty Dumpty, and I'll never be able to put the pieces back together again. So it's this chronic wellspring of sorrow that often is internalized and deferred because of all the caretaking tasks that are involved. We know that there are a lot of physical symptoms that uh, caregivers experience. Uh, high blood pressure and insulin levels, impaired immune systems, they may be at risk for cardiovascular disease. And elderly spousal caregivers who experience caregiving-related stress have a 63 percent higher mortality rate than non-caregivers of the same age. That's huge. That's huge. So, and again, we're not talking just about um, caregivers that are elderly. We're talking about caregivers that are themselves sometimes in poor health. Um, I showed a, a video to our class the other day about um, growing old, and there was this one woman being interviewed who is 99, I think, and she said, of course, my daughter's 72. <laughs> you know? and it's like, you've got that. It's not like their children are young. <laughs> and, and so um, I think that that's another, another reason that the sooner we can get family support, the better. 
And we know, uh, again, the data suggests that there are higher levels of depressive symptoms, mental health problems, and it, depression is the most common psychological disorder for caregivers. And unfortunately, particularly stressful caregiving situations may put caregivers at risk for engaging in harmful behaviors toward the care recipients, particularly people who may have uh, histories of ambivalence in the relationship or people who aren't getting much support, um, who just and, and haven't had the luxury or the advantage of some of the educational tools that can help people redirect. I remember my dad, even though he was a, a pretty seasoned guy, saying, that wasn't a very satisfactory conversation with your mother. <laughs> and he'd keep trying to redirect and redirect and re or excuse me, not redirect, he'd try to correct. And, you know, we had to work with him for a long time to help sort of shift that model. Um, so again, I think it's important to remember too that while caregiving is stressful, there are a number of studies that suggest that there are beneficial effects, including feeling positive about helping, feeling appreciated, and feeling like that their relation relationship with the recipient of care has improved. My sister had a pretty ambivalent relationship with my mom until she got so sick. And by the time my mom died, there was just a sweetness between them that had really evaporated, really melted away any of the old tension that had once existed. Um, and so, you know, there, there's some good outcomes. And, and there's certainly some things that are pretty darn funny that happen. Um, when we were able to move my parents to, to Oregon, they were able to live again together for the first time in a number of years in a lovely adult foster care home. And my dad in his one bed with, with Parkinson's and my mom in hers and both in wheelchairs. And one morning when I was working at hospice, I came to work and people were huddled around a computer and they were all crying. And I said, Why, what is wrong? What's going on? And they whipped the screen around and it was my dad singing to my mom as he did every morning from his wheelchair, telling her how beautiful he, she was. And it just did all of us. <laughs> but that coming back to what are the things they still enjoyed? Music was something they always shared and it was something that they could still continue to do. So sometimes we have to kind of really go on a, a hunt to find out what were those things, especially if you don't have family members involved and you don't necessarily know what their love was, but they may give you some good clues. Um, what I've learned in memory care units is they don't let people drink coffee sometimes with dementia and my mom lived on albeit weak and not very flavorful, watered down Swedish coffee. Um, she lived on coffee and chocolate. And so she would literally pry my coffee cup out of my hand if I went to visit her. And I thought, oh, what the heck? <laughs> you know, let her have some coffee and some chocolate and, and we'll deal with it. <laughs> but I think sometimes you have to look hard for what it is that they, they respond to and what gives them pleasure. Some of the fears that I think most caregivers have is the, of the future. Certainly of the progression of the disease. How long will this last? How bad will it get? Will they remember me? People certainly fear the end of life for patients. Um, but some caregivers are fearful that death's never going to come. You know, when the dying goes on in an endless, seemingly endless way, that can be really devastating for caregivers as not only emotionally, psychologically, but it can also be devastating financially uh, as, as these situations progress. So palliative care can help by Support, 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 support. I haven't figured out what the acronym is for that, <laughs> but other than <laughs> But again, offering, as, as Sue so eloquently said, offering validation and a sense of control for patients in the early stages of dementia. Patients in the early stages uh, of dementia have very clear awareness of the symptoms as they decline, but later they may have vague feelings of loss. And I think that's one of the things that's really hard to tease out. Um, the, the huge teacher for me in dealing with my mom was that there were moments when she was pretty darn lucid, even in her advanced stages, but they were really difficult to predict. Um, they came and they went. Um, and there, there was a vague sense of loss all the time. I think about the video and the woman who was saying she was lonely, even though her daughter may have left five minutes ago, um, that, that that sense of loss that they can't give words to um, may be fairly profound, even for people in the more advanced stages. So things that we can do is that, as we've talked about, empathic listening, although not joining with the story of despair, <laughs> um, expressions of support, reassurances of remembering by affirming, uh, and when appropriate, possibly touch. 
uh, palliative care can offer aggressive symptom management throughout the continuum of the disease. It can help to clarify goals of care with, with the patient as they are able, and as the illness progressive, progresses with surrogate decision makers. Advanced directives and the POLST can really make a difference, again, in understanding what they would have wanted. And again, it can be a tool to bring back to the family as things are changing to say, do you remember your mom said or your dad said that this is what was really important to them? It's often been said that more important than the piece of paper with advanced directives is the conversation. You know, having it early, having it often, particularly before the patient with dementia loses too much ground to be able to participate in that. Um, are most of you familiar with the POLST? And uh, I think most facilities uh, ask that patients have POLST, although be careful. I noticed when my mom's room changed in one of the caregiving units, the POLST above her bed wasn't hers. <laughs> and so, so I, I learned to look. <laughs> Um, but it, all of this can assist in, in also providing education. Palliative care teams and hospice teams can often interpret some of the underlying conditions and interpret symptoms that are happening, particularly if there has been change and you're trying to make sense of what's causing this. You know, why, why is this person so upset today? And if you can't pinpoint it to an event, then we might want to go after some of the physical symptoms or changes physically that are occurring to, for the patient. As I mentioned, recognizing when patients are at the end of life with Alzheimer's or, de or uh, dementia can be really d difficult, but as all of you, I think, are very well versed in trying to evaluate symptoms in patients that are nonverbal uh, for pain or other distress is really important. And it, you have to really become a, a very seasoned CSI person because um, it's not easy to interpret. Why are they so agitated? Why are they moaning? Why are they rubbing their leg? You know, and it may or may not make sense given the context that you've been treating them in. There may be something new going on. Um, and so the other issues that I think are complicated when working with dementia and, and Alzheimer's disease are things like the use of antibiotics. At what point is enough enough? You know, they, there comes a time when they don't work anymore. Antipsychotics versus some of the other medications that are often used to really calm behavior may be appropriate, particularly with people with trauma histories. But I, I would suggest that, that we want to make sure that whoever's prescribing them knows what they're doing with an elderly person. Uh, that's where your geriatricians, um, a good psych nurse practitioner that understands geriatrics can really be helpful. Um, other medications and certainly feeding tubes. Um, that's a huge issue for families, as you know, that um, often we prefer that, that feeding tubes not be offered to patients, particularly with advanced dementia. But certainly, as we know in hospice, that's often a really frightening thing for families who interpret that as starving their loved one to death. And so one of the things that, that I try to talk with families about is how important it is to, if, if they're willing to not go down the feeding tube path, how helpful it is to have someone feed their loved one, that it's an opportunity for interaction, you know, the chocolate cake and the coffee with my mom, um, you know, that, that it's a chance to really walk the journey with someone and give them some pleasure um, and reassure them that they're still being well, well cared for. Um, the, again, the use of advanced care plans are helpful. When someone is near the end of life that has dementia, some of the things that uh, may be uh, indicators for you that, that things are changing medically is that they may seem more agitated or confused than they were before. Uh, there may be other behavior changes. There may be difficulty breathing, a lack of interest in eating or in drinking. Um, and I think that that's certainly something we see in people at the end of life is that they're not interested anymore. The body is shutting down. And again, reassuring uh, the family members that you're doing good mouth care, you're really trying to make sure that their comfort needs are attended to is really important. Anxiety and restlessness may well be related to medical factors. It may be an infection. Uh, I sure learned about that in hospice. Uh, it may be constipation or diarrhea. Uh, maybe urinary retention. Uh, it may be pain that is from way back when. Does this person have a history of arthritis? You know, have they always had problems with their back? You know, are there other things that, you know, we're not necessarily paying attention to, but the behavior uh, may 
r really result, or m the behavior of anxiety and restlessness may be an indicator. Uh, we want to attend to their feet. We want to attend to their skin. These are all things that all of you know about. People toward the end of life often don't have enough caloric intake to really keep their skin in good condition and their immune systems are compromised. So obviously that's where turning and really good attention to the skin becomes so, so important. Um, and I think it's important to remember that both people with and without Alzheimer's disease have the same areas of the brain where pain is processed. Um, and, and I think that's an important thing to take a look at. Uh, the Geriatric Society suggests really looking at patient behaviors such as facial expressions, verbalizations or vocalizations, body movements, changes in activity, mental status changes. All of those are potential pain indicators in older adults with dementia. I love this picture. <laughs> okay. Other behaviors associated with pain are grimacing, moaning, groaning, rubbing a body part, agitation, restlessness, irritability, confusion, combativeness. Um, and I find your best sources of information are often the CNAs because they know their patients. They know them so well. Um, and if not a CNA, it might be a family member that's saying, boy, this is really different than last time I was here, that notice something different. And that may be a red flag for you to maybe really assess for uh, pain or progressive illness um, that may indicate um, other kinds of interventions. As, as was mentioned by Sue, there are a lot of other things that we can try to do uh, to offer pain control for patients who can hear and respond. Guided mental Im imagery. You know, I, when my dad was hallucinating pretty strongly toward the end of his life. And thankfully, it was a happy hallucination. And he kept seeing these fields of yellow flowers. And we didn't know what it was, but we just went with it. It was way better than something awful. And uh, my sister went to Sweden last summer, and she said, I think I know what it was. You know, in the summer in Sweden, all the hills are covered with yellow flowers. Uh, that are different than the flowers we have here, and, and we think that's what it was. You know, it hearkened to his childhood, and that was really a joy for us, but we just went with it. And so I brought as many yellow flowers into his room as I could find. Um, relaxation, you know, just breathing with people, as, as was mentioned also. For, for caregivers, counseling for stress and anxiety, um, spiritual support, and again, music. I'm often amazed at the role that music has for people who have dementia at the end of life. Um, signs that a patient may be dying. Um, how many of you have worked with dying patients? I bet everybody practically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously it may look different from patient to patient, um, but some of the indicators in an otherwise difficult to prognosticate situation is if you think they're experiencing pain, difficulty breathing, again, as I mentioned, lack of interest in eating or drinking, and uh, in development of pressure sores simply because they don't have the nutritional um, wherewithal to really continue to keep those at bay. I think the most important thing you can do is trust your instincts. You guys know this work and bless you for doing it. Um, seek advice and support, and that may be from hospice, it may be from a palliative care, contact support organizations, and as, as was mentioned previously, not only self-care for family caregivers, but self-care for yourselves. This is hard work, and it's not fun to have a, a Judy coming at you <laughs> who's mad, you know, and yet, you know, I think sometimes you go home and you take a really deep breath and a really long bath or take the long drive home, go the scenic route, just anything to sort of go, okay, this was a hard day, but it was an important day, really important day. And, and I think being able to let yourself grieve too. We caregivers are a pretty stoic lot sometimes. We're really good at taking care of everybody else. Um, but we're not so good at taking care of ourselves until we're about to drop dead. <laughs> and I think that that's a really, really important thing to, to do, to identify what is it that brings you joy. We were talking about what, what brings the person with dementia joy. What brings you joy? And how can we maximize it? Let yourself grieve. Let yourself accept support. You know, if you've had a particularly rough patch with a patient or you've lost someone that you were particularly attached to, how might you acknowledge that? How might you take care of yourself? How might you ritualize the loss if that's something that might be helpful to you? In closing, I just simply want to say, as a, a dutiful daughter, 
of a woman with advanced Alzheimer's disease. Thank you for what you do every single day. Um, it really taught me about loving geriatric care, uh, navigating that with my parents, both long distance at first and then here in, in Oregon. Uh, but I would say that um, just as Wendy Lesbutter's book, Counting on Kindness, The Dilemmas of Dependency says, you know, we have to count on the kindness of strangers. And when my folks were in another state, all the time, I hoped that someone was being kind. And it has changed my behavior toward anybody that I see that needs some help. Thank you for what you do.